So in this video, I wanted to explore one of the most archetypical environments for D&D, fantasy sewers, and show how they can be far more interesting than dirty little square streams with side paving, but also show ways to make them totally affordable, whatever your budget. But I'll talk more about that at the end. Welcome to the Archive. My name is Matt. The core of the system are these fake height water tiles, which can be replaced by these empty variants to make two different kinds of interesting encounter depending on where in the sewer you are, or even combined in larger builds to show more complex sewer systems and larger fights. Incidentally, if all of these foam bricks look scary time consuming, just know that I designed a tool to cut, bevel, crack, and indent them all in one step that takes seconds to do. More on that later. These can also be pulled out quickly and replaced, to some degree at least, to enable a changing environment that your players can influence with the turn of a release valve. Both types also come with corner variants for interesting layouts and winding systems of filth, as well as extension pieces to make massive epic scale fantasy sewer flows that can be stacked for disgusting adventures beneath an ancient metropolis. Speaking of cities, these pipe flow accessories can actually be lined up with any sewer openings you have in my city tiles above. The sewers are exactly as wide as the roads too. But I digress, or obsess, I forget which, probably both. These flows combine with the second tile type, these sloped walls, which work perfectly with any stone walls from my system that you might already have made. But if you haven't made any, the tool works perfectly for the bricks in those too. And there's even something now for the 3D printers among you. As usual, this is all crafter's preference. There are always fast and cheap options for everything. Just pick whatever suits your needs. Incidentally, most of my builds cost between sort of £20 and £40 to put together, depending on the options that you choose, and about the same in materials when split down over multiple projects, and eventually the tool cost is even less. So for the rather irate commenters going because they think I'm advocating spending a fortune, I'm not. So please calm down and try not to discourage other people from trying something new. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank you guys. If you've watched my last video, you already know what's been going on with me. I'm not gonna talk about it here because that's not the point of this video. But I just wanted to address something that is very important to me. The level of support you've all given me through this has meant so much. And I'm not just talking about Patreon, I'm talking about the YouTube comments too. You guys have waited patiently for this video and I don't wanna move forward until I give all of you, not just patrons, some kind of thank you for that. This is why I'm doing some giveaways. For the people on YouTube, if you stick around to the end, I'll explain how 25 of you can win this STL pack because I meant what I said. Those comments really got me through it. Frodo wouldn't have got far without Sam. As for my patrons, I'm including these four extra packs on top of the usual on Patreon for the next three months. I've gotten a lot of great feedback about these STLs that I designed with Fabio. So I know this is something a lot of you will appreciate and more importantly, actually use. When I make these STLs, I specifically choose things that I think this amazing and very active community will actually be able to do something with. Seeing your works in progress on the archive discord is genuinely one of my favorite things. It means the world to me that you guys actually use this system that I spend hours figuring out and perfecting. This is what it's all about for me. So I'm really looking forward to sharing all of these extras because without the support of these amazing people, this art that we're creating together wouldn't exist. And I hope these packs really get across how much I treasure all of you. Anyway, these pieces allow you to build sewers as cramped, dense networks of tunnels or epic wide waterways with high arched ceilings, depending on your needs at the time. They also make awesome additions to dungeons to make them more interesting, making dungeon rooms more interesting visually and allowing for interesting combat in corridors of various widths. As they combine with existing walls, they're also totally compatible with accessories that I've shown how to make previously or that you might have printed off as a Patreon thank you STL. To get started, I figured out all of the foam shapes that I'd need for the build and spent some time cutting them all down to size. The first pieces I made are these sloped walls. These can be combined with half width floor tiles, which are literally just floor tiles cut in half to make basic sewer shapes using negative space and brown painted paper as the sewer flow. You can even dab Mod Podge on thin or thick acetate sheet to get a very cheap and serviceable water look. This was something that I considered doing for my water tiles, but I really like the way that resin has so much more detail along the coastlines. If you did want to do this, I noticed that Rachel Does Wonders recently tried out this method. And aside from that I would advise using acetate instead of glass, it's pretty on point to what I would have done as a cheap alternative for that video or this one, for the water at least. 
The floors also allow you to use a magnet on the bottom of minis to make even larger creatures balance securely on thin walkways like this. But even if not, they're one and a half inches wide, which gives plenty of space for some of the more dynamic poses that minis are made with these days. I'm showing you how to make these walls and arched columns in a video that I'll be releasing in two weeks. So if you like how these function here and how they can be used for better dungeons too, go check that out when it drops on the 2nd of October. In the meantime, it gives me more space in this video to delve into these sewer tiles. I really wanted these sewers to be more than just dirty streams and to give you options for a wide range of varied environments, from vast filth sluices with plentiful opportunities for shove actions to end badly, to echoing epic dried systems of ancient civilizations now inhabited by an equally vast monster. To achieve this option of scale, but still make it easily stored and reused, I ended up making both full and empty sewers. Full sewers are something that has definitely been done before, and while I feel like I've added my own detailed gross spin on that, it's these empty floors that really give you some new and interesting options for combat. I started by making some fairly standard half width floor tiles, some double length, and added magnets to the front like any other floor tile. Check out my getting started video for more details on basic floor tiles. I added them to the sides too, but later realized that this was slightly less efficient than other methods that I'll show later. I kept them, but you can just not bother. With that in place, I cut these curved pieces from foam blocks. I did this using this STL jig that I made, but you could also do it with this paper template that I made and cut it freehand on the lowest temperature. Or make your own curved template. The idea is to make them all have the same curve. Just bear in mind that the STL accessories have my curve in mind, so if you plan to use those, it's probably best to use one of my template options. The reason I used small blocks rather than just one long one is that it keeps the same curve accurate across long distances. The longer the cut, the more the inaccuracy, even with a jig. Plus, this uses less resin. I hot glued these to the floor tile and added half inch bricks to the sides, including along the bottom edge. But this is one of those bits that you could skip to save time. It's only visible when used vertically like this. With that done, you're pretty much set to make the brick work. Now, this can be time consuming to do manually, but it is perfectly possible. I really wanted to make life easier for us though, both for this and pretty much all brickwork in the future. So I paid Fabio, my go-to 3D sculptor, to help me build a brick stamp that wasn't lacking in depth when used on foam. It took a lot of experimentation, but eventually we got there using physics. Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, science. You can probably see what I mean here by physics, but the basic versions are actually part of the welcome pack now too for patrons. So you can actually pick it up now if you want to while also helping the channel. There's a little more to it than just the special design though. There's also the method. Now, originally this was a bit brute force, but though this was very fast, it did have some downsides. My ear balls. Not to mention over-enthusiastic use can lead to maintenance. So thankfully, my fiance hit me with a bolt of inspiration and pointed out that vices exist and I have one. I'm gonna blame illness for not noticing this one. You just line up the stamp on both sides of some foam, crank the vise until it's almost completely squashed. I leave a little gap to get a nail in and then peel it apart carefully. I found it best to pull at the short edges and peel up one side at a time. I do specifically recommend a wide six inch woodworking vise like this. Other types do work, but this gives you a nice even pressure. When you are making wall tiles like this, I would recommend making them about a 16th of an inch thicker than you usually would because the the stamp does squash them ever so slightly, especially once textured. Anyway, for these taller rows of bricks I needed for the empty flows, I used brickwork on one inch foam made using the stamps, textured them using my roller STL and trimmed them to one quarter of an inch thick using the hot wire. Then I beveled them lengthways more heavily with a biro to loosen them up a bit and just gently bent the foam at the bottom so it'll neatly align with the curved pieces that we cut earlier. After which it's just a matter of hot gluing them in place. I then did more brickwork, one quarter inch strimmed it and cut it down to one and a quarter inches or five bricks tall and hot glued that on top with a little bend in the bottom so it stands straight. Simple. The offcuts here can also be trimmed to half an inch to make nice floor tile clip-ons for later. While I had the stamp, I also used it to quickly make some more modular walls for corners, but more on that in the sloped walls video soon. Now all we need is magnets. I added one on the second brick on the bottom and the first brick on the top. This is to match up with some awesome clip-on accessories that I had designed by Fabio for patrons as an STL that will allow you to show off grated areas, giving a perfect place to trap someone or be cornered. 
or even an interactive piece of terrain to shove an enemy towards or balance on, potentially impaling them on one of these spikes. These accessories are STL only, unfortunately, but that's mainly because it's either STL or they wouldn't have existed at all. There's no way I had time to manually craft all of these on top of the whole sewer build. Obviously you can craft your own from things like card or plastic card, styrene, that kind of thing. I just really did not have time to on top of everything else. But if there's a lot of interest in how to make these things by hand, I will do a video in future. Finally, you can add magnetism to the brick walls as shown in this magnetic brick walls Patreon video to let players on monsters actually climb them, which I think is always a nice feature. When painting these, I followed my usual painting stone scheme, with a few updates like airbrushing the base grey layer over the Black and Mod Podge primer using Procryl Warm Grey. I also added dirt in the cracks, as I show in the City Tiles video and updated Temple Blocks bonus video, by smearing the bottom with dirt grout mix, then spraying with scenic sealant and wiping with paper towels. I've also started doing this for my floor and wall tiles, though I keep the inside walls and floors less dirty than the outside. One last option here. If you really don't like the sloped wall look for sewers and you really want that curved wall look, you can use this method to make two inch high versions that will work as walls over the sewers. It just won't be as flexible as the sloped walls for height or showing arched ceilings, or using in dungeons, or adding future accessories to. But you can absolutely do it if you want. And now for something completely different. I often get asked about where you can get something like these jigs 3D printed for you if you don't have access to a printer yourself. And until now, I hadn't really done enough research to give a fair answer. We will arrange the facts neatly, each in his proper place. I decided to rectify that this month and got several companies, including this month's sponsor 3D Ghost, to send me some test pieces so I could check things like quality and packing before recommending anyone. Oh yes, yes, that's right. Pockety, 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 this is one of the FDM pieces that I got them to send me to compare quality between different providers. And 3D Ghost definitely holds up. And they even do resin prints now too. They came with minimal cleanup needed, packed securely, and everything movable worked smoothly. I basically have no hesitation in recommending these guys. They do exactly what you expect, deliver a well-printed piece on time and safely packed. If you need something like these jigs 3D printed, or just want to pick up some scatter terrain to go with your crafted stuff, then I can honestly say 3D Ghost is a great place for those in the US to make a custom order with your own STL or pick up one of their stocked pieces. I even managed to get them to give a 30% discount on anything over $50 to my patrons in the US, on top of free shipping over $35. This is just another way I'm really trying to help out my patrons and give a thank you for everything that they do for me. Anyway, back to gross sewers. The core of these tiles is really simple. They're literally just half a floor tile with a quarter inch thick wall hot glued to one side and supports glued to the bottom. Magnets are added later to match the placement on the empty flows. The top one is easy. The bottom one is just on the third brick up, three eighths of an inch across. The supports here I'm quite proud of. Instead of using a full length chonker of a support block, which was the original plan, but would have been a lot more storage and potentially fiddly to attach, I came up with a system of thin walls at the bottom. I used some leftover 10 millimeter foam that I had lying around. This not only means that they don't require fiddly assembly, but also that they can be stored into locking like this on their sides, saving a ton of storage space. I didn't actually attach these with hot glue until after the resin was done though, and painted them separately. This avoided any leaky problems. I did magnetize these in pairs though, one for each side that matched the magnet polarity of the magnet above at the top, placed on the third brick from the bottom, like mentioned before. Basically lining up with the left hand half of the brick below. I also saved time here by only texturing the bits that would be visible with these end grates that I've made for patrons. You could save a lot of time here by not adding these to the bottom walls at all if you don't intend to use them vertically anyway. Quick mention here for supplies and equipment. I've actually negotiated a discount on magnets for my audience at these providers rather than taking any money from the sales myself. Bonus mention for Spider Magnetics in the UK. They keep magnets at a spectacularly fair price compared to others. So make sure you support these guys if you, you know, value that. If you need any other supplies, I link everything that I use along with guides and bonus info in the equipment list in the description of every video. Buying from the Amazon links there does help to support more videos like this. On to the resin. Step one is always safety. Get a filter mask and replace the filters if you can smell anything. A good way to test this is to just have some isopropyl alcohol and uh, wave it in front of the mask. If you can smell it, 
replace the filters. You also want to ventilate the room. You can do this during if it's a reasonably moderate temperature or after it's all finished curing if it's cold outside. And keep your pets and mini, uh, I mean children, out of the area until it's completely clear again. I also have tons more tips than this on using resin in general from my water video and I've compiled them in a guide linked below just so I don't bore the life out of the rest of you guys who only want to see me make the grossest water I possibly can. So on to step two, colour and weathering prep. Starting with a smooth layer of suspicious brown on the fake depth, then adding a bit of mossy green effect on the walls from the bottom up and blending it into the rest of the stonework along the top row of bricks by brushing downwards. I deliberately left the floor clip on without this effect so it could be used in non-sewer areas or alongside less revolting floor tiles that I might work on later. I gave this a seal with a solid layer of satin varnish by brush over the waterline areas and deep in all of the cracks. Finally, I super glued down some feature pieces like this sewer beast tentacle and this disgusting eyeball, both of which you can grab as Patreon throwbacks this month. With that sorted, I mixed up the first layer of resin. I mixed these 10 milliliters at a time in shot glasses, which minimized the amount poured at once and gave me the most time and control to work with each piece without worrying. I also found some silicon stir sticks for mixing, which I credit for the almost complete lack of bubbles with minimal effort. For the first layer, I add as little as I can get away with for full coverage, spreading it out using another silicon tool. This layer is really just a foam bubble catcher. I also did a thin layer of clear resin along the walls here once done with the bottom, using a silicon tip sculpting tool. To top off the brown layer, I added some pigments, but more on that later. Once that resin is solid, I dammed up the edges using a strong material. In this case, I used styrene, but you could use foam core designed to overlap the pieces. I had these left over from the water build that I did a while ago now, and just marked out a new water height at the middle brick, exactly one inch from the bottom, and added a new layer of overhead projector acetate sheet over them. If you don't put a new layer of acetate sheet over them, the pen ink can actually transfer off to the resin, which is not ideal. I make these mistakes so you don't have to. We actually want the little edge lip of the resin pour to be slightly above one inch exactly, but if you use a pen that leaves a 1 16th of an inch line like this Sharpie, the top of the line should be pretty much perfectly placed. If you didn't see the water video, the basic idea with these is that they are perfectly right angled on the ends and they overlap. So the overlap pressed up against the back end of a piece next to it keeps it nice and vertical, which makes getting these things to slot together perfectly actually pretty easy. I did try using clear packing tape instead, as a few people suggested to me, but the hot glue just peeled right off it, making it kind of useless for this right angled method where the corners overlap. I also found out that OHP Printable sheets are not the same thing as OHP acetate sheets. Be careful not to look for OHP. What you want is acetate. The right stuff is now linked in the equipment list along with everything else. I lined these up along the bottom of the foam and sealed the bottom and joints with hot glue, erring on the side of caution and adding more rather than less. Paranoia kind of helps when you're using resin. Parano you'd be paranoid if everyone was plotting against you. The additional paranoia, add a small amount of clear resin over the edges and up the side walls before pouring in the main resin to double seal any leaks. I got several leaks on this build, all down to missing a seal on a corner. Double check these just to be safe. Legitimate paranoia aside, with that in place, I made a start on the actual water. I drew a lot of inspiration here from real life sewage images. Overwhelmingly, the color was a fairly vivid, sometimes misty, yellow orange brown. For reasons I'm sure you smart people can extrapolate. Disgusting. My first step was adding a similar vivid yellow orange brown pigment mix to the bottom of each tile to be my sludgy underlayer. I mix this from brown and yellow oxide pigments. Your version of this might differ a bit, so just mix until you reach a disgusting colour that you're happy with. Just a reminder, this pigment that I use is cheap and readily available oxide pigment used for colour tinting grout. As far as I can tell, it's actually the exact same stuff as hobby pigments, just sold in larger bulk for a fraction of the gram to gram price. Links in the equipment list below. I found the best way to add this was to separate the clumpy pigment using a fine mesh baking sieve, though a stretched piece of tights over a plastic cup works almost as well. I kept both the clumps and the fine pigment for reasons that you'll see later, and then applied, aiming to get the layer as thin as possible by shaking the shot glass side to side 
is scatter the pigment on a little at the time, rotating it if needed to get into the corners. Now for the resin. I mixed the main pores in 500 milliliter plastic cups, then I cut the upper third off. This made it easier to mix them up, easier to pour, and wastes less resin in the pour as well. I added measuring lines by measuring out water into a test cup and then copying the line over to any cup that I actually wanted to use, keeping the water out of it. For the watercolour itself, I mixed in resin colouring. I found that this works a lot better than acrylic inks, and also unlike last time, I tried mixing the colour into the resin before the hardener, which in theory puts you under no real time pressure and makes the whole process much less daunting. However, it is possible that this might have been what led to my resin being super temperature sensitive as the chemical reaction may have been disrupted. I didn't have time to go back and do another test to thoroughly check this, but it might be worthwhile colour tinting the resin after you've mixed it, just in case. I used two drops of caramel per 10 millilitres of mixed resin and hardener, then added the hardener to this mix, stirring in a figure of eight slowly for three minutes. It is overwhelmingly important not to stop stirring or to pause in pouring while doing this. For examples of what happens when you don't keep stirring, see Zorpazorp's mishap in his massive 30 litre resin pour, which caused me almost physical pain to see. Another quick why my project had a lot of problems issue here, it's possible that the amount of colouring that I used also disrupted the chemical reaction. So it might be worth going with one drop per 10 millilitres instead, just to be safe which is also a lot cheaper. Anyway, once mixed, I poured it in just barely enough to cover the pigment by pouring the bare minimum over half the tile and tilting it to cover the rest, which keeps it nice and thin. This then let me use the back of a brush to disturb the pigments along the bottom, stippling it back and forth in lawnmower-like rows. This stirs up the pigment into this misty, sludgy underlayer, blending it into the relatively clearer water above. If you don't think you have enough resin mixed to pour the layer, don't risk it. You need to completely cover the layer and remixing some resin and pouring it on top of already warm curing resin is kind of in my experience asking for overheating problems. Better to lose a little bit of resin than to lose an entire tile that you then have to make again from scratch. Trust me. As with the water tiles, after about 40 minutes, I carefully popped bubbles with a dirt cheap cooking blowtorch. I worry about you sometimes, Candace. Also good for lighting barbecues in cold, wet, windy weather. I left this to cure and cool down, covered from dust by some paper until it was more or less cool to the touch at the edges, and then added the next one third resin layer on top. Letting it cure and cool down here is important. Too deep a pour, or pouring while the layer below is still warm and your piece can overheat, tinting the resin green or even warping it beyond recognition. This happened to me multiple times and tested my sanity a little as I kept having to throw out the failed tiles and make more. That said, I feel like this was more of a problem than it was when I did the water tiles, and the resin seemed far more sensitive to temperature in both directions. As mentioned, I suspect this is because of the heavier colouring of the resin, because I bought a new batch of resin to see if mine had run out of date or if it was a bad batch, and things still failed in places where I let the heat get even slightly out of control. This is why I ended up using three layers rather than two for about half of my pores, which mostly solved the problem, but I do recommend following that list anyway just in case. That aside, after blowtorching and waiting for the middle layer to cure again, I poured the top layer along with some of the chunkier details, like drifting branches made from plant roots or sticks added to a few of the tiles, and a rather unfortunate corpse that definitely didn't drop some kind of magic ring in there. I added this to the bottom layer rather than the top layer, so his hands would go deep enough. You can keep him level and flat by blue tacking his head and feet to the dams at the sides until the first layer of resin cures. With these in place, I blowtorched it after about 40 minutes again, and the next day peeled off the edges. A dribble of isopropyl alcohol is actually really great at loosening hot glue without having to hack at it with a knife. Though you do still need to trim the excess resin off the edges with a sharp knife. This is a good opportunity to try and get them all to line up perfectly. Finally, I disguised the trimmed edges by using two layers of Mod Podge. The first layer I did reasonably thick with a silicon tool to avoid bubbles, and dabbed some undulation into it with the back of a brush, but avoided placing it on the edges so that the middle would build up a little bit of height. Also during this layer, for finer details, I added some plant life in the form of this spring grass flock near the edges. 
and a few of these brown micro leaves to match the ones on the city tiles above, though honestly they were practically unnoticeable once we did the pigment later. These I sealed in with another layer of dabbed Mod Podge, this time covering the edges as well, before adding <coughs> floating organic material to the pieces. This I did with the same colour pigment as before, but also with a newer mix of 8 to 2 to 1 yellow ochre to orange to dark brown. If this is a slightly different colour each time, don't worry too much about it. So is the um, material we're imitating. Again, I filtered out the less clumped pigment, but unlike before, we actually want the clumped bits here, for obvious, rather gross reasons. Once it was nice and clumpy, I started with the smooth stuff, scattering it on in both colours quite finely before tapping it off, leaving a very thin layer of patchy grossness. With that in mind, I tapped both colours of the clumpier bits on in random patches, poking with a cocktail stick if needed. I aim to keep these scattered. Splitting the clumps out like this helps us mostly avoid lots of floating forbidden pancakes of indeterminate origin. You're not planning to use the bathroom for the next half hour or so, are you, Poirot? Well, just let me check with my diary, Hastings. No, it would seem not. Good. If you need me, you know where I am. Though I did add these in places to hide some overenthusiasm with the floating plant life earlier. Moving along, to seal it in place, I used isopropyl alcohol in a spray bottle, and keeping a solid distance so the burst of air wouldn't disturb the pigment. It is important not to overspray or spray too close, or it'll leak the pigment out and you'll get a different effect. Unless you want that effect. Kind of up to you, really. Then we just do some dip and dab with iso in a palette and a cocktail stick, so you can poke the pigment clumps to break them down into more watery blob shapes while they're wet and vulnerable. Or, if you're feeling super extra, you can use a blunt industrial syringe like this, which is a little bit easier. Once this was absolutely dry overnight, I added the bare minimum of water to some gloss Mod Podge, thinning it just enough so that it would itself level, and then applied this gently, dabbing it on with a soft brush in a reasonably thick layer to seal it in place more solidly. Much like the resin, you want to go back to this with a cooking blowtorch to pop bubbles. It does actually work on Mod Podge too. But that's them done. This video is the culmination of a vision that I've had for a long time now, and that I could have made over time as several projects. But if I did that, then it probably would have given the game away somewhat, and I really wanted you guys to see the final results all at once. This method of videos actually kind of costs me money in ads and sponsors and that kind of thing, but I really love letting the community be surprised and hopefully inspired by the end result without spamming out 30 odd videos on the same topic. The other major advantage is that it keeps the tutorial concise, accurate and all in one place, rather than spread over half a dozen videos and studded with potentially bad methods that I might have changed by the end. If you do like seeing that process though, I've started releasing more regular update videos on Patreon to show that more, but they're not particularly edited and planned as the main series videos, which will always be the priority. If this level of resin looks like a lot to you, you can have the feet of the tile be a quarter inch taller, the sides a quarter inch shorter, and halve the resin used, adding only a single layer. You could also make the dams cheaper by using thick card instead of styrene, or you could even just do the acetate sheet trick that I showed earlier on the tiles themselves, making the feet a half inch taller and adding the Mod Podge and brown just directly on top of the brown paint. For cheaper connections, you can also use the card tab method that I show in the original magnetic building system video linked in the description, and the foam for the resin tiles can be cut by hand with a knife from half inch foam with a bit of practice. Finally, as promised, I'm doing a giveaway of my very first STL pack to you guys. This set of magnetic doors for my modular walls and this gruesome door mimic to match. I'm going to pick 25 random people who comment below with their favourite RP Archive video. And if you wanted to like and subscribe too, that would really help, but really isn't needed to win. As for terrain, don't get me wrong, things like battle mats will always have their advantages, but for a DM who hosts at home or travels by car, these tiles are no less transportable than a Warhammer army, and both look stunning and provide far more interesting gameplay opportunities vertically. Overall, I couldn't be happier with how this build turned out, and I can't wait to show you guys the other aspects. Keep an eye on the channel for the sloped wall video going public in the coming weeks, or you can check it out right now as a patron, alongside the sewer accessories and expansions video in the link down below. Other than that, until next time, I'll be in the archive.